Thanks for today's lecture. Manuscripts do not burn. On the track of the manuscripts of the Syrian Christians uh, of India by Professor Istvan Pertzel, Department of Medieval Studies, Central European University, Vienna. This is the fourth of a monthly series initiated by the International Research Division of the India International Center, Delhi, Kriti Samhita, the plurality of Indian knowledge systems. It forms part of a project, Samhita, South Asian Manuscript Histories and Textual Archive, which the IIC has started this year with the support of the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Samhita's goal is to create a knowledge resource on manuscripts from South Asia that are now housed in libraries and private collections outside India. This would be an online platform <coughs> scholars all over the world would have access to. We are honored to have as chair, Professor Keshavan Veluthat, who is Professor of History at Delhi University and is, was also Director of the Institute for the Study of the Heritage of Coastal Kerala, Kulangalur. He is the author of many critical works in English and Malayalam, monographs and essays on the political structure in early medieval South India and its intellectual history broadly. Um, Professor Venethal, may I request you to introduce our, today's lecture? Thank you. Thank you, Neil Harika. <clears throat> I am extremely grateful to the International Research Division of the India International Center for asking me to sit in this chair this evening when a great scholar of international repute is uh, speaking on an important uh, topic related to many aspects of human relations, cross-cultural, interreligious, and linguistic. Professor Istvan Persev, a profound scholar and a dear friend studied ancient Greek, ancient philosophy and patristics and is currently working on the Gershuni manuscripts from Kerala. Gershuni is a script which originated in the 7th century when Arabic was becoming the dominant spoken language in the Fertile Crescent. But Arabic alphabet was not yet fully developed. There is evidence that writing Arabic in Garshuni influenced the style of modern Arabic script. After this initial period, Garshuni writing has continued to the present day among some Syrian Christian communities in the Arabic speaking regions of the Levant and Mesopotamia, who commonly use the Serta or the Western Syriac script. Occasionally, other languages such as Turkish, Persian, Sogdian, and Kurdish languages and Malayalam have been written in the Syriac alphabet. And these are sometimes referred to as Gershunis in the plural, with several additional characters and uh, some kind of uh, tweaking. The Malayalam version is better known as Karsoni or Kursan and had been in use till the early 20th century among the Keralite Syrian Christian clergymen and laymen. This points to a very important reality which is forgotten. The equation, one language is equal to one script, is wrong. As is well known, the Roman script is used to write many languages such as English and so on. Devanagari is used to write Marathi, Hindi, Sanskrit, and other languages of India. Likewise, the same language would be written in different scripts as well. Devanagari was hardly used in South India to write Sanskrit, where Grantha did the job. In the case of Malayalam, about which Professor Purcell will hopefully speak, at least four scripts were in use. Patalta, Grantha, Arab Malayalam, and Karsoni. Before the present-day Malayalam script was standardized, following the uh, introduction of the printing press. Thus, 
the story of Gurshani will throw immense light also on the evolution of that wonderful instrument of linguistic communication, the script. With outstanding between you and Professor Praxel, I now invite Professor Praxel to tell us more about Gershuni. Professor Iswan Praxel, please. Um, uh, thank you. Um, in fact, I think, um, so I have to ask something because originally I, uh, I prepared something else. Uh, I have a, a lecture on the Gershuni, and if this is what I should present, I am very happy. It's just I have to look for the PowerPoint uh, because I have just given uh, a talk recently uh, about the Gershuni. Um, uh, but uh, would you uh, forgive me if I am now speaking about Gershuni? Yes, a little bit but mostly about Syriac manuscripts. No, uh, I, no, I, must have, I must apologize. No, I no, assume, no, don't apologize. No, no. Uh, I assumed that you will be speaking on Gershuni. That is why you said like this. Please, please speak about Syriac manuscripts with, uh, uh, with this uh, touch of uh, Gershuni. Uh, because, because this time, uh, I want, because there are some new discoveries. And it's true that, that in the recent uh, it, that in the recent uh, years, I have worked a lot on Garshuni, and we have even students working on Garshuni manuscripts. And, well, uh, 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 and, and very interesting things. Um, uh, and we, uh, we have even created the Unicode fonts for Garshuni Malayalam. And we, we are now working, and it's almost ready, an inscript keyboard, uh, uh, so, so that that you may write in Gershuni Malayalam as if you were typing Malayalam, and 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 we are now also working with my student Sharanya Chandran, uh, from who, who graduated earlier from uh, Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, and now she's in the PhD program of our university on. Uh, optical character recognition and handwritten in text recognition of Gershuni Malay. But uh, as there were some other recent discoveries uh, concerning uh, manuscripts condemned at the Synod of Diamper, I thought that this time I will speak about this. Gershuni plays a role because it was the late Matthias Mundadan and a fantastic uh, uh, Kerala historian who discovered the original Malayalam text of the Synod of Dianta. So about this I will certainly speak. And let me share my, uh, my PowerPoint. Just a moment. Um, and it will, it will start with the Garshuni manuscript anyway. Uh, let me share my PowerPoint. Um, and uh, uh, I should have given more information about this talk. Uh, it, it's entirely my fault. Uh, can you see? Yes. Slide show. So, do I have 40 minutes from now? Yes, please. Okay, good. So, I chose as the motto of this talk, uh, uh, a sentence from a Russian uh, novel, uh, The Master and Margarita. I suppose that it's not very well known in India. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the great texts that we were reading uh, in uh, in the uh, time of when when communism was uh, prevalent in. So not 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 how to say 
when dictatorial communism was prevalent in Hungary because it was a fantastic book. And there is a manuscript uh, written by a, a writer and the manuscript is basically the novel of the life and condemnation of Jesus. And, uh, and this manuscript is being burned, but finally it is found because manuscripts are not burning, says the, the hero. And Rukopisi uh, Negariatsa uh, in Russian. And this was one of the motives of all my research in Kerala, a, a research that I initiated in the year 2000, that is to say 22 years ago, um, when I volunteered, uh, we, when, uh, it was uh, 24 years ago that I participated in a, in a conference in Kotayam at the St. Ephraim Ecumenica Research Institute. And the first time I had the opportunity to see the Syriac manuscripts are, uh, are manuscript archives of, uh, um, uh, of, of, of the Christian communities there. And it was then that I volunteered uh, to, uh, to uh, raise funds and try to do something about these archives, which meant uh, basically digitization and cataloging, which was a completely new thing at that time that you could digitize manuscripts and, and publish them. What you see here uh, in the initial slide is the, the oldest and the most, uh, uh, the most uh, authentic copy of the, the acts of the famous Synod of Diamper, which condemned uh, the customs and the writings of the Syrian Christians of Kerala, uh, a council convened by uh, the Portuguese Archbishop of Goa, Aleixo de Menezes, who was also acting as the viceroy in India of uh, the Portuguese king. Uh, and it was the late Matthias Mundadam who found this manuscript and placed it uh, in Dharmaram College in Bangalore. So it is there and the fathers were kind enough uh, to allow the digitization and this manuscript, which contains the authentic text of the Synod of Diamper, awaits study. You know, my Malayalam is poor, and we would need a PhD student to work on that, uh, with, uh, whose mother tongue is Malayalam. Uh, this uh, is just a reminder, because I suppose that most of you very well know uh, Kerala. Uh, the main Christian places uh, in Kerala. And some pictures only about the Christian community as it lives today, just to remind you of the rich traditions of this community. It, the one who initiated manuscript studies in Kerala is Maharaprem, a great scholar. This is, uh, um, uh, he is in a procession on Palm Sunday in 2005 when we started our digitization work. Uh, at that, this is with uh, Mar Basilius Thomas I, uh, the Catholicos of the Indian Syrian Orthodox Church, Father Ignatius, who was one of my greatest helpers, and some monuments. Finally, the Jesuits who uh, played an uh, important role uh, also in the Synod of Diamper, that much has remained from their seminary in Chennai. And our work was in manuscript archives. Here you see uh, our technician, Joseph Varghis, preparing the digitization of the collection of St. Joseph's CMI Monastery, Mannana. Um, you see that when we started our work, this is in 2008, um, uh, uh, the manuscripts were not kept. They were very well kept, uh, how to say, according to ancient standards, 
but keeping them in closed cupboards is not uh, healthy for the manuscripts. So our work was not only to digitize, but also to uh, uh, to 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 uh, renew the conditions in which these manuscripts are uh, kept, so that they uh, remain for the future generations. And in 2016, the same archives were looking like this. The same for Marapem, whom I mentioned, and it is a quite recent news that the whole of Marapem's collection, uh, 124 um, Syriac and modern Aramaic manuscripts are accessible online in the uh, uh, VHMML, Hill Museum of Manuscript Library Reading Room, uh, entirely catalogued uh, by Radu Mustaza and James Waters. So this is the first entire collection, which is completely published. And uh, many more manuscripts are already published. The number is now 1093, but not all of them are catalogued as yet. And what I want to speak about is that famous, um, that uh, I see that there is, ah, yes, um, uh, the famous, uh, uh, the, the famous uh, Synod of Diamper, which gave rise to a myth. And my doubts concerning this myth were very much among uh, the motives which brought me to India and do this digitization and cataloging and whatever. Because the great myth of Diamper is that the Portuguese, um, when they convened the Synod of Diamper and condemned the uh, customs and beliefs and even the books of the St. Thomas Christians or Syrian Christians as heretical, uh, basically destroyed the past and the history of this community. And often you can read in manuals and history books about the community uh, that unfortunately we know very little about the early history of this community because everything has been destroyed in Diamper. What I will prove in today's talk is that very little has been destroyed. Most of those things that were condemned have been preserved and can be found uh, mostly in the, in, the, in the Kerala archives. Why we know little about the early history of this community is because of the linguistic wealth of the documents and especially European scholars who, like me, approached uh, the, approached the uh, the history of this community from the Syriacist side, knowing only, let's say, European languages like Portuguese and Latin and Syriac, they hit a wall because the most important documents of the community about the, the distant past are in Malayalam. So uh, it is the local historians who will make the great revelations about the past, because for them, Malayalam, Sanskrit, Tamil are easy. And we can delve into this past if we learn these languages. But let us go back uh, to Diamper. This is just, I am not. This is perhaps good to show. This is the old granite cross in front of the Diamper Church where the Synod was held. Of course, the cross is much older than the Synod. I think it was erected in the 16th century. And here is the text, um, Bangar or Dharmaraka College Manuscript 32, or Garshunimayam 2, uh, which, is, which is one of the great treasures 
that we have digitized and which awaits study. And if there is anybody in the audience who would like to work on this, most welcome. Uh, I am starting with the condemnations of the Synod. Uh, I, uh, there is a, an old, old 17th century English translation, and basically this is always used. Here, for the sake of this conference, I have retranslated the relevant parts from Portuguese. Uh, the Synod declares that in the books, of, so yes, uh, two types of books were condemned. The, the liturgical books and the biblical books and theological books, and also some books which they called magical books, magic books. So I begin with the New Testament texts. The Synod declares that in the, uh, sorry, the Synod declares that in the books of the New Testament, just I have to want see now. Yes. So in the books, sorry, sorry, of the New Testament used in this church and written in the Syriac language, there is one thing in the Gospel of St. John, the beginning of the eighth chapter, the history of the adulterers that was carried before our Lord Christ. There is also one thing in the said books, the second epistle of St. Peter, the second and third epistles of St. John and that of Jude. And in the fourth chapter of the first epistle of St. John, this verse is one thing, having been impiously left out, who dissolves Jesus is not from God. And in the same epistle, these words are one thing. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And in the Old Testament, there are one thing, and so on. And that all these should be corrected according uh, to the Chaldean copies which are amended, that is to say, Syriac texts that were already amended by the, mission, by the Western missionaries and the Vulgate Latin edition. Now, the f yes, and, and there are other uh, such things. I don't want to go into all the details, but I can now affirm that the complete New Testament canon, as uh, was condemned at Diamper, continued to be copied in the later times. And those manuscripts which contain this uh, condemned canon were in use in for hundreds of centuries as long as this Syriac text was important for the community, both in Jacobite circles and in Catholic circles. Now, let us see Mannanam manuscript, Syriac manuscript uh, number 10. This manuscript contains two parts written by the same scribe who was called Philippos Bar uh, Yosef in 1730, that is to say, 131 years after dying. Mm. The, the, the epistles of the New Testament, beginning with the epistle of St. James, according to his uh, Syrian New Testament canon, are precisely in the form in which it was condemned by the Synod of Dion. This is the second part. Um, that is without the second letter of Peter, the second and third letter of John and Jude, um, uh, and interestingly, there is a Roman Catholic interpretation of the Psalms in it, which mean, shows that it was used first by a Catholic community, which did not obey Diamper. And here is the colophon of the manuscript in beautiful East Syriac letters. And here is uh, the translation uh, of the colophon. Finished is the writing of the three Catholic letters together with the 14 letters of the blessed Paul. You see, there are only two Catholic letters instead of, uh, of, of, of the number. Now I can't tell you the precise number uh, in which it is contained in the, uh, in the Latin canon. And then there is a doxology, uh, glory to the father who has strengthened 
thanksgiving to the son who is from him, who was so good, who has so good, and to the living and Holy Spirit who proceeds and is from him, who has brought my feebleness to the harbor of the completion. Amen. Now, this Trinitarian formula was also condemned at Diamper because the Latin uh, rule was that the Holy Spirit proceeds from both the Father and the Son. And the Syrian Christians uh, there, who simply followed the standard East Syria canon, which was condemned, uh, held that the Holy Spirit proceeds only from the Father. And this, uh, and this scribe in 1730, who was a Catholic and who, um, and who, um, who, uh, who even included a Roman Catholic commentary on the Psalms in his book, still uh, wrote the doxology according to the old formula, which was condemned by time. And this is the second part of the colophon. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, and priest Philip was buried. Joseph finished writing the 17 epistles in the year 1730, a Wednesday, 7 January, and has completed it through the grace of God. Uh, yeah. Another, uh, um, another uh, part of the condemned text was uh, concerning uh, theological books. And this is what the, uh, this is what the, uh, uh, what, what uh, Decree 14 says about uh, heresy in the church, in the Kerala church, in the Malankara church, and about uh, the condemnations. Given that the purity of faith is very much conserved by means of the books containing the good and sound doctrine, and that to the contrary, the peoples are corrupted by means of books containing suspicious and heretical teachings by which the errors are infiltrating into the hearts of ignorant people who read them or listen to them. Also, because the Synod knows that this diocese is full of books written in the Syriac language by Nestorian heretics and by other devilish saints, which are full of many heresies, blasphemies and false doctrines. Therefore, it orders in virtue of obedience and under the pain of excommunication, incurred by the very fact that no person whosoever, being of whatever quality and condition, should dare from no one and further take in his hands, translate, read, or listen to any of the following books. And here comes a list of the books. So, you see that the question that I'm asking here, whether all these books have been destroyed, is a poetic question, because we have found these books. One such book is uh, uh, the, uh, the book that is called the Book of Councils, in which there is a fictitious letter of the Supreme Pontiff Gaius with false signatures of many other Occidental prelates addressed to the Babylonians, in which they confess and say that the Church of Babylon is not subject to the Roman Church, and that it, with all those who are subject to it, is immediately subject to Christ and does not need to pay reverence to the Roman Pontiff. Um, that this, what this Book of Councils is, is very clear. It is the well-known uh, uh, nomocanon of Abdisha of Nisibis. But the author is not mentioned. Why? Now, here is the answer. What you see here is the title page of Abdisha's nomocanon in the collection of the Chaldean Syrian Church in Trishur. Uh, that was where our, we started our digitization endeavor because of the hospitality 
of Marabrem Mukem, the metropolitan of the Chaldean Syrian church, who was uh, the most important uh, moving force behind this endeavor, who was also the first to start to write a catalog of his, uh, of his collection, and who is a great figure of manuscript studies in India. Um, and he allowed us, and together uh, we published a facsimile edition of this most important text, which is dated 1290. That was, uh, so th th this copy was written in, in the 13th century, 1290, when Abdisho, the author, was alive, and one year after the book was written. So it's one of, it's really the most authentic copy of this uh, text, which is in India. But what you see is, I hope you can see the arrow, that the name of the author has been erased. So here is the translation. With the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ, I begin to write the concise collection of conciliar canons. That's the precise title of this book. Of, and then the name of the author is missing. Um, and the name is also raised here in the introduction. Um, and I would say that it is these erasures that prove that the book, that the book was there in India before Diamper, because we have found many such books where the title or the name of the author was erased because this was apparently a, 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 a practice of hiding the books from the, Portu, Portu, from the Portuguese inquisitors uh, so that they could not easily recognize what is in the book. Um, the book was in the Middle East until at least 1525 when there is the last marginal note in the book. And so it must have arrived in India between 1525 and 99, but most probably it was brought by Mar Abraham, the last Persian metropolitan of the Indians, when he came first as an Astorian metropolitan. Later he Catholicized, went to Rome, and came back with a clearance from the Pope, uh, but still uh, struggling with the Portuguese. First he came in the 1550s, then he was caught in 58. They wanted to deport him, he escaped. Then he went to the Chaldean Patriarch, that is to say the Patriarch in obedience to Rome, who sent him to Rome. He was consecrated in Rome, came back in, 15, in six, 1568, and then ruled uh, the church until 1597 when he died. And you will see uh, that he had two normal canons. This was the first, which is this very old copy. And here is the letter uh, of Gaius, which was mentioned in the con condemnatory acts. Fifth chapter on the subject of which are the canons that show the authority of the patriarch over all the general activities of the Christians and on the reverence that is due to him from the entire community. And then synodical letter of the Western patriarch, which was sent to the Orientals. This was mentioned in the condemnation acts. But when he came back in 1568, or uh, uh, yes, uh, then he brought another Nomocanon, which was already a Catholic revision of that Nomocanon, and it was written uh, in, uh, it was written uh, especially for Marabra. And what you see here in the margin is a curse on Nestorius by Mar Abraham, uh, uh, which I will not be able to read for you, 
But what is also interesting here is this Latin note, which says pertinent at Carmelitas discalcatos. That is to say, it was in a Carmelite library. More on this a little later. So here is the here is the colophon, which is not, not uh, the marginal note by Mar Abraham, which I'm not able to uh, analyze now, but I have published it uh, several times. Um, and here is the history of the book. This book was taken by Mar Louis Paraparambil, the first bishop of the Ernakula Mangalmai Archdiocese of the Syro Malabar Church, when he was expelled from the Carmelites, which shows that it must have been, the book must have been among the books kept in the Warapura Carmelite Library. Now, the Carmelites have inherited the library of the Jesuits. And it was in this library that the books confiscated by the Portuguese were, um, were kept. Because the Portuguese perhaps burned some books for show, but they were scholars. So they were eagerly keeping these books. And when Claudius Buchanan uh, came from Kolkata and visited the library, still saw them in 1806, only he did not recognize that what he saw was uh, the books condemned at Dianta. However, he was uh, smart enough to steal one of those books, which is now in the Buchanan collection in Cambridge and condemns, a, it's a miscellaneous manuscript uh, collected from several manuscripts and con contains only texts condemned at Diamper with the writing, this, this, this book is heretical, this uh, book is prohibited. So this shows and proves that these people did not burn the books. And unfortunately, the other, uh, only these two books which were stolen, partly by Claudius Buchanan and partly by Mar Louis Paraparambil, have been uh, saved. I was hunting for uh, possible books remaining from this library, but uh, got a lot of misleading information, but did not find anything. Now I turn to biblical commentaries, and I am always reading uh, first the, uh, the condemnatory text. So it's in the same 14th uh, uh, canon of the condemnations, also a book entitled A Commentary on the Gospels, wherein it is everywhere pretended to be proven that there are two persons in Christ and that Christ as a pure creature was obliged to adore God and stood in need of prayer, that, uh, uh, that he was the temple of the most holy trinity, that the wise men who came from the East received no favor from God for the journey they took, nor did they believe in Christ. Uh, again, the name of the author is not mentioned, but here is the commentary. This is Piramadam, Syriac 14, um, which contains all those things that were condemned. What you see, however, is that the title and the name of the author are missing. And this is why, this is a, I think a 19th century copy uh, of the text, uh, but, um, but it, it was, they kept copying them. Uh, so it's not the original. Um, and, uh, but apparently in the original, which is lost, uh, the title and the name of the author were erased. And this is why the Portuguese didn't know uh, what precisely was the text that they condemned. But as they had a good seriousist, Francisco Rose, uh, they could read the text and they saw it is heretic according to their standards. Just, uh, just a little comparison between uh, 
the condemnatory text. Um, the wise men who came from the East received no favor from God for the journey they took, nor did they believe in Christ. And this is the original text in Pyramid on Syriac 14. There is no reward to the Magi in recompense for their toils because they did not come out of their own will. And even after that, they did not believe in the truth. Just as to Balaam, there was no reward for the fact uh, that, uh, that what happened to him was a prophecy about, about the, our Lord. Uh, and the other uh, condemned uh, items can also be found here. And here is another copy of the same text. So we have found two copies of this condemned text. This is from Trivandrum. Um, and what is it, in fact? It, is the, it, it, is, it contains selections from the great gospel commentary of Ishoyab of Merv, a ninth century theologian of the Church of the East, of the Nestorian Church. Um, so that's it. Other condemned articles. Uh, another canon says, the book that is being called Ugwarda, in Syriac this is Varga, or Rose, in which they speak about two persons in Christ and say that the union of the incarnation was accidental and that Our Lady gave birth with pain and passion and they take her to be the mother of the sons of Saint Joseph, whom the latter had from another woman, which is accompanied by other blasphemies too. And here it is. This is Trivandrum, Syriac Manuscript 8, two hymns of Givargis Varda condemned at the Synod of Diana. Just a moment. Also the book that is called Maklamatas, in which the author intends to prove at large the distinction of two persons in Christ and that the union in Christ is accidental, confirming this with similar false blasphemies. Now, Maklamatas is kind of a distorted Arabic title for the paradise of Eden, of Abdisho, of Nisibis. Once again, we can see that the name of the author Abdisho is not mentioned by the canon because somehow they didn't know who the author was. And here is the, uh, the, the, the Maklamatas, the paradise of Eden, uh, transmitted in a manuscript copied in 1807 by a Jacobite scribe. In fact, a, a Jacobite scribe, uh, which means that, the, uh, that um, this Nestorian text was also kept being copied uh, by the opposite faction, which adopted the Syrian Orthodox faith. What it testifies to, for me, are two things. One is the faithfulness of the community to its tradition, which could not be broken by colonial interventions. And on the other, uh, uh, um, on the, yeah, so the faithfulness to the tradition and the resilience of the, uh, of the community, but which could not be broken by the colonial intervention. This is the title of the text, text in this copy. In the strength of our adorable God, we begin to copy the book of the paradise of Eden, written and arranged in verse by the holy and Christ loving. And then the name of Abdisho, the author was erased. In the original, here you don't see any uh, uh, trait of erasure because it's simply in this form that it kept being copied in Kerala. And because of these erasures, we, we know that this is not something that arrived in Kerala after Diantel. That, that, that the text was hidden from the Portuguese before the condemnation and was kept being copied for centuries. And here is the end of the text, um, which shows that at the end of the text, again, the name of the author was erased in the original. You see, uh, 
by the holy and Christ-loving Mar, and Abdisho is missing. And my last item, there was, there were two books, so-called books of magic and divination, soothsaying, that were condemned. So, sorry, just I have to read. So the book of laws. Um, here it's very important that this is my translation because before we found this lost, uh, this condemned writing, even the Portuguese text was not well comprehensible. Also the book of laws where they are placing that which they call the ring of Solomon. Sorry for the dictography. Uh, and I have added here the diagram because it's about a diagram uh, with many more superstitions for the choice of good days for marriages and other businesses in which are contained many blasphemies and pagan customs. As the Synod prohibits under the same censure all those books that are dealing with lots and the choice of favorable days. What about this book of laws? In fact, we have found six copies and variants of the book of laws, four in Syriac and two in Malayala. Here I must say that I found only one text in Malayalam in the Venkadattu library. And it was my student, um, uh, Therese Pateri, who has just submitted her, uh, her ME thesis, who has found the other five uh, on the basis of a book written by uh, Dr. Kurian Thomas on the Niranam Grandavari, uh, where he publishes another Malayalam version. So together with this, we have three Malayalam and four Syriac versions of the condemned text. Here is the first one I found in the Venkadattu library. You may see that the, the soothsaying was based on a diagram with 49 Syriac numbers. The soothsaying practice was uh, called, and I don't know whether it's still practiced, but it was still practiced in the 19th century. It was called Kanketu Vidya which meant that the one who wanted to know the success or the lack of success of an endeavor that he was, um, he was planning, be it a business endeavor or a marriage or something else, uh, was blindfolded, uh, pointed with his finger to one of the numbers and for the four, 49 numbers uh, belonged uh, 49 explanations. Here it begins, but it, here, here are not yet the explanations. Um, and, and here uh, 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 you read what was the Malayalam, uh, uh, the Malayalam uh, the title of the book, Pal Pustakam. Pustakam is this book, but what is this Pal? I will return to this, and this is the last thing I am presenting. So this manuscript is dated 1866. It's a priestly manual containing the services a priest has to perform, including the divination. Because as the Portuguese also have written, it was part of the priestly uh, uh, duties uh, to perform the divination. And here are, the explanations in Malayalam, you see the number and then an explanation. This was what we knew until very recently when Therese Patteri uh, discovered the Syriac texts from which the Malayalam were translated. And we have even traced when the Syriac text came to India uh, in 1504, uh, they were brought here by a bishop who was reputed to practice 
divination and magic, Mar Dencha. And Mar Dencha's uh, pupil was uh, the famous uh, 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 no, no, uh, uh, the, the famous Katana. No, uh, the, 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 the name um, uh, doesn't come to my mind because I'm a little bit amnesiac. Uh, uh, um, about whom there are many uh, tales, and there was even a TV uh, series about the uh, not Kandana to Katana. The, the, okay, so so is it, famous is it to Katana? This is what I want to say. Sorry, I have been so many times to Kadamatta, but I am amnesiac. Thank you so much. So the Kadamatta to Katana was a pupil of Mar Denha who brought apparently two books here, this one, the, uh, the Ktaba, the Pal, and Pal is a Persian loan known words about lots, omens. So, and, uh, and the, the, the Parasaman, a uh, fragment of which we also, uh, Paris has also found, but this I'm not present in now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parshad, for that uh, extremely informative talk. And uh, I'm glad that uh, you did not uh, you did not speak on Garshuni, the details, but uh, you, you decided to uh, blast a very, very long-standing myth that uh, this bulldozer of uh, 1699, 1599, that is, uh, the Synod of Diamper ironed out all differences in the church, and uh, from that day onwards, everything was uh, the same. That the Roman Catholic Church, the, the Govan, the Govan people, backed by the church and the imperial state in Go uh, Portugal, were able to uh, steamroll the entire Christianity here, including burning of all the old manuscripts. Thank you very much for dispelling that uh, wrong notion that uh, many of us were under. And uh, uh, there are a few questions which you have in the Q and A box. Would you like to respond to them? The first one of them, I thought is not quite uh, relevant to the talk, but the other two, uh, Asha Gopidath and uh, Babu Taliyat, uh, this would be this would be interesting, of course, if you are uh, if you are keen on answering the first question by Naomi okay. Caligaro, that also that also you you are. Uh, so let, let me also answer the first question. Should I should I click on answer live? I don't know. You you, uh, you please answer live. Please answer live. Okay, so I am answering live. Um, nothing, because this is uh, how to say. <laughs> this is a myth. Yeah, so whether my work casts any light on the issue of whether Jesus spent time in India, uh, this is a myth that is much more difficult to dispel than the myth of Diamber. There is absolutely no basis for that. Uh, uh, these are the, the typical fake stories when somebody says that he has seen a manuscript that is not anymore available, but that manuscript said that. What kind of evidence is this? This is nothing. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, such manuscripts were not found, and even those who claim that they have seen such manuscripts were lied. So this is my, my answer. Uh, uh, moreover, it's very, very difficult to go into the early history of the church. Um, the earliest document, uh, uh, documents about the existence of a Christian community in India are dating, and, and they are Western evidences, uh, and a little bit doubtful, uh, they are dating from the fourth century. And they say that uh, somebody, a missionary, went to India and found Christians there, and it is very much possible because the monsoon winds made it possible to go to India, but uh, but 
uh, it's very much possible, but we don't know what India means. Uh, because India was the place from where the, uh, the, uh, the spices were coming. So incidentally, the Arabian Peninsula was called India um, and so on, or, or, or even incidentally Ethiopia. So sometimes they are speaking about outer India and inner India, and inner India would be India in effect, and outer India, all that uh, space between India and the Mediterranean. Okay. Uh, second question by Asha Gopinathan. How are the manuscripts digitized? Is some company doing it or are you doing it yourself? It is a very expensive process. Uh, it's not that expensive and it's becoming much cheaper now, but I started it in the year 2000. Okay, what we did in the year 2000 was a shame because we didn't know how to do. And my technician, uh, with whom I parted away, the first technician, he was, uh, he was doing it with a scanner. It was, it, it, was, it, was, it, it was a scandal even then. And, and it was the technician who wanted to do it. So I allowed it because I was uh, ignorant, uh, but that was, for something it was good but it was mostly good to uh, spoil our reputation. Uh, I came back in the, two, in, in the year 2002 with a camera, with, <laughs> which was for digitization, but which needed uh, one minute for taking one shoot. But what, what we did then was okay, but it was uh, very few manuscripts. And uh, it was only for a month. And finally, I came back with good uh, photographic, cameras um, and a good technician in the year 2005. Then this Hungarian technician who could not stand very well the, you know, the climate, uh, it was too hot for him. Uh, uh, he taught an Indian technician ever since we were digitizing with an Indian team. Um, uh, the, 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 we were taking photos. It was not very expensive. Maintaining the team was difficult uh, because uh, the access was intermittent. And then uh, in order to keep the team working, we started to digitize palm leaf manuscripts because it was difficult to access the Syriac manuscripts, the paper manuscripts, but it was easy to access the palm leaf manuscripts which were uh, considered as worth nothing. So we have digitized over 60,000 palm leaf manuscripts, and there is great work being done in India because at least those palm leaf manuscripts, which were written in modern Granda and Arya Rutu, so the modern scripts, uh, can be easily read. And Indian colleagues like uh, Professor Susan Thomas and her team at Sri Shankara University and Father Dr. Dr. Father Ignatius Payapili. Um, the archivist of the uh, Angamali, uh, uh, Ernakulam Angamali Archdiocesan Library, they have done wonderful work on those palm leaves. Um, so um, for a while it was going on, as far as I know, the digitization work is not going on, which is a, I cannot go now because of my teaching duties, and this is a pity, because there are many more manuscripts. And what I am dreaming about is continuing with other communities, such as the Muslim community. There are 10 or 100 times more important manuscripts just lying around than Christian manuscripts, because it's a, a, a bigger community as well. Now, Babu Taya. Uh, uh, we met first in the Warburg Institute. Uh, uh, in London, uh, yes. Nestorian heresy, which was widespread among Syrian Christians. There was indeed an attempt on the part of the Portuguese and Jesuits to somehow reconcile the Nestorian heresy among the Syrian Christians in order to impose Catholicism on them in a more strategic or pragmatic ways. This happened toward the end, yes, and 
It was connected with the foundation of St. Hormis Church in Angamali, where this Persian saint masked the identity of the Nestorian Hormuz. Where there are similar strategic attempts of reconciliation. <laughs> Look, uh, this is a very difficult uh, question because um, I don't agree with the Nestorian heresy. Uh, these Christians are simply Christians. And even from their, uh, from their answer uh, to the Portuguese attempts, the question of heresy or orthodoxy was important for the, for the, the European missionaries. Why? Because they were fighting religious, basically religious fights and later religious wars uh, between mostly Protestants and Catholics. And also there was a schism between the Oriental churches and the Catholics. And for them, and, and it was just after the, the, the Council of Trent, which was uh, reinforcing uh, uh, a certain type of Catholicism. So they considered even those Christians who accepted the, uh, who accepted the authority of the Pope heretic and they were hunting for the heretical books. And now, Aleish de Menezes was a very tough and very dogmatic person and also with uh, improper means. For example, I mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the Garshuni Malayalam acts of Diamter. Those acts contain much less material than the, uh, than the uh, 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 than, than, than the Portuguese acts. So they made a shorter text read and signed by the local priests and they published another text in Portugal um, uh, to satisfy the, uh, how to say, the, the views of the Portuguese public. And certain things which we think were condemned by, uh, by the Synod, and there were all time uh, references to these condemnations, were in fact not condemned in the Malayalam Acts. And the, the Malayalam Acts also uh, show incremental growth. Those Malayalam Acts, which were published by Skarya Zakaraya, contain less material than the Portuguese, but more than the Garshuni Malayalam text. On the contrary, Francisco Rose, who was the one who was reading these books and was condemning them, was much more favorable uh, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the local Christians. He loved them and he was loved by them. He was even denouncing the means of Aleixo de Menezes in Rome uh, because of the brutality of the means. Because he thought that only by offering something uh, to the local Christians and making them happy can, uh, uh, can they be converted to Catholicism. And um, that's another story. The works in Malayalam and in Syriac that Francisco Ruz wrote in India, which indeed contain, as you say, a kind of concil conciliation about, uh, about uh, the Catholic uh, doctrine and the Syriac tradition. Um, uh, Anthony, Father Anthony Mecheri published two books about Francisco Ruz and his very much rehabilitating him as practicing a kind of accommodation. Uh, the, 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 the Syriac and Malayalam material that we found is very much confirming what Father Anthony Matcher is writing on the basis of Portuguese documents. How can I date, yes, Susan Thomas, how can I date the Kadamata to Katanar to the period? Uh, it's, look, uh, you may say that this is not very good scholarship, but um, 
I admit that uh, uh, I take uh, Syriac uh, church history, uh, um, uh, uh, Syrian Christian, but a Malayalam church history that we found from the uh, from the end of the 19th century. This is also in a Manama manuscript, and it should absolutely be published, um, in which uh, the author who, who can be identified as, as, as um, uh, a certain Abraham Ramban, um, he wrote it in the end of the 19th century. Um, uh, so he writes about Mardenha and, um, and, uh, uh, and he says that the Kadamatatu Katanar was his pupil. And I take this information as genuine, but it can be questioned. Uh, this, is a, this is a polemical writing about against the uh, Mar Thomas, uh, whom it uh, smears, uh, um, and it's uh, and and he says that all these Mar Thomas were practicing magic. Uh, they learned the magic from the Kadamatta to Katanar, and the Kadamatta to Katanar learned it from Mar Denha. Mar Denha came, and, and and there is another thing as well. Yeah, in the in the in the I think the northern wall of the of the Kadamattam Church, um, uh, um, uh, 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 a skeleton was found um, in the nineteen nineties, I think. A skeleton, 19, 1996 or so, a skeleton was found, and there is even a board uh, commemorating this finding. And they say that it was the Kadamata to Katanar who was buried in the uh, in the wall. But priests were not buried in the walls of the church. The uh, East Syriac practice was to bury bishops who were residing in a church in the wall of the church. And I think that the skeleton that was found and the tomb is that of Mardenha, who was staying in Kadamattam. And how do we know that he was staying in Kadamattam? Because there is the local legend of a the certain Mar Abba or Mar Abu as according to the Western pronunciation, that is to say, a bishop uh, coming from uh, West Asia. And uh, he is dated by the local legend to the ninth century. But, uh, but this text of uh, this um, Malayalam church history from the end of the 19th century uh, calls the four bishops, the four Nestorian bishops who came in 1504, um, the Mar So they were the Mar Abbas. So one of them, that was the name that, that, that stuck to them. And, uh, and one of those bishops was Mar Denha. He was the most, uh, the youngest and the most active among them because he wrote a letter uh, to the patriarch, which is extant. Uh, um, and this is the first known Portuguese account about the encounter of, uh, uh, of um, non-Portuguese people uh, with the Portuguese. Um, and this, this Mar Denhais was a very important person, apparently was one of the great architects of the Syriac renewal uh, in India, and according to the customs of the Church of the East, he was bringing uh, uh, Syriac books with him, and also magic books, and according to the legend, 
kitót di kadamattattu kattame. How was the original condition of these manuscripts? What was the traditional preservation method like? And how did uh, your method of preservation differ? It should be, uh, it is Father Ignatius who should be asked um, um, when we found the manuscripts, we, they were rat eaten, dusty, worm eaten. Many times they were being burnt. Uh, in some manuscript libraries, they were kept very well, like Mannaman, for example, or Trishur. But in other libraries, uh, uh, they were not kept well. In other libraries, they were very much venerated, but they didn't know how to conserve them. And Father Ignatius, uh, on his own, was learning all the traditional methods of preserving paper manuscript, palm leaves. He went also to the Hill Palace Museum and learned their methods. And uh, uh, we were so, uh, 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 we were so uh, impressed by his dedication to the conservation of manuscripts that we convinced him to go to, uh, to Liverpool for a, uh, to do an MA in, uh, in archival studies, in archives preservation. And he went with the, uh, taking loans from his community, so had incredible difficulty learning it. And now he's uh, one of the most knowledgeable archivists uh, in, uh, in India, I think. And, and, and then he convinced the custodians going everywhere uh, to preserve the manuscripts as they should be preserved. So I'm very, very grateful to him. And then, Uh, there is a 13th century manuscript in Syriac from Pampakuda on Kanondo. Yes, this is the famous uh, Canon of Barebroyo. Uh, it is from, um, it is one year older than the tissue manuscript I, uh, I uh, showed, the uh, West Syriac Canon of Barebroyo dated 1289, uh, 99, uh, no, 1289, 89, while the tissue manuscript is 1290. What this, these are, this is the oldest copy of Barabroyo's Canon, as the tissue manuscript is the oldest copy of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of the East Syriac Canon of Abdisho. Um, how did it arrive in India? Uh, apparently, because there is a text saying this, uh, apparently uh, it was Mar Basilios Shukralla uh, who came to India um, as a uh, Syrian Orthodox uh, uh, missionary bishop um, who took it with him in 1751. And why are the most, uh, the, the oldest copies of the two normal canons kept in India and nowhere else? I think because the Indian diocese was so important. So uh, the one who came to govern the Indian diocese, be it Mar Abraham, who was originally a Nestorian envoy, an envoy of the Nestorian Patriarch, or Mar Basilius Shukralla, who was an envoy of the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch, um, uh, for them to rule the diocese well, it was important to come with the most authentic copy. And the most authentic copy was most probably in the possession of the Patriarch. And the Patriarch entrusted the envoy. Th this is an imaginary reconstruction. Don't I don't have a, uh, a, any evidence for that, but this is why I imagine that, that the, the Indian diocese was so important that the respective patriarchs entrusted the most uh, venerable and the most authentic copy of the church canon law books uh, so 
that the Indian diocese, which was so important, which was also the wealthiest diocese of, the, of those churches, um, that this diocese can be governed well. Uh, please let me know if this, uh, these answers were uh, satisfactory. Professor Valipdat. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Purcell, for that, uh, for that very engaging discussion that uh, you took us through. Now, I think uh, now since uh, almost all the questions are answered and uh, we have had a very good fair, I hand it back, hand the, hand the uh, platform back to IAC, Dr. Gopalakishan. Thank you so much. I don't think there is anything more left for me than to thank you, uh, Professor Purcell. It was so illuminating. Very, very interesting to know about this aspect of history that many of us were not that well aware of. So thank you so much. And also Professor Keshavan for guiding through this and very, very in such an able way as you always do. Thank you so much to both of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. But if, uh, okay. <laughs>